So, you think you're pretty well versed in the English language, right? Well, if you grew up in an English-speaking country, you're pretty sure you have this thing down pat. Well, maybe you do, and maybe you don't. This is Greg McRae, founder and CEO of Foundation Group, and welcome back to our 501c3 University channel, where we strive to make nonprofit issues understandable. And on the other side of the intro, we're going to find out just how good your English really is. The English language can be difficult for people whose native language is, well, not English. Our mother tongue has a lot of weird rules and exceptions, plus the lexicon grows every single year. My sister-in-law was raised in a Baltic country where they don't use articles, you know, A and the. After 30 years in this country, she still drops her articles. It's great. The nonprofit world sometimes seems like it uses a language all its own. And it's not so much strange grammar, punctuation, or verb tense. Instead, it's mostly normal English words and phrases that are easy enough to read, but not very clear in their meaning. And if you're not versed in all things nonprofit, you may be completely unfamiliar with these terms. Even if you've heard them a hundred times, people are still often confused about what they really mean. Here are seven common words and phrases used in nonprofit circles that do not make sense in any other context. We'll start things off with a twofer, inurement and private benefit. Now I say twofer because both are strange words and phrases, but they are often used interchangeably. Inurement in a nonprofit setting means that an insider is unfairly benefiting themselves by misappropriating a nonprofit's assets to their own benefit. Now the IRS says a 501c3, it can't be organized and operated for the benefit of private interest, such as the creator or their family, other designated individuals, or persons controlled directly by or indirectly by such interests. An example of inurement or private benefit might be a board member who uses company assets for his or her own personal use. Another example could be a key employee paying an exorbitantly high salary. Yet another might be a founder using the nonprofit as a platform for steering customers into his commercial business. Key point, inurement is not a good word in the nonprofit world. Since we're coming off the topic of inurement, our next phrase is intermediate sanctions. Now, I would bet a dollar that 99% of the people watching this video have never used that phrase in a sentence. So what are intermediate sanctions? Intermediate sanctions are essentially financial penalties levied by the IRS against a nonprofit that's been determined to have impermissible inurement going on. For example, let's say that an executive director makes a reasonable salary, but the board decides to pay the director a bonus equal to a 20% commission on the amount of donations raised by the director personally. Now, there's no cap on the potential commission, and John, the executive director, well, he wrangles in $500,000 through his fundraising efforts. In a situation like this, should it get scrutinized, the IRS may very well decide that the $100,000 commission is excessive and not reasonable. Remember, we've talked about reasonable compensation before. If they determine that inurement has taken place, the IRS could levy intermediate sanctions penalties of 25% of the excess amount against the board members individually, not against the nonprofit. Now, that is a certain way to discourage inurement. Should the nonprofit not correct the situation, that penalty can jump to 200% per person deemed liable. Now, are intermediate sanctions levied very often? Fortunately, no. It's almost always the result of an IRS audit, and those aren't very common. It's also quite subjective. What is considered bad enough to trigger sanctions in one organization might not even raise an eyebrow in another. It's all very relative. Now, this is another strange sounding phrase, disqualified person. So what's a disqualified person and what are they disqualified from? A disqualified person, particularly within the context of a private foundation, is a person who is an insider or significant contributor. Examples are officers, board members, substantial contributors, people who co-own a business together, and anyone related to any of those I just mentioned. You get the idea. So what about the disqualified part? Well, basically they're disqualified from being treated as if they don't have a significant conflict of interest. In most settings, they can't be employed by the foundation they serve. There are exceptions, but they're pretty narrow. We did a video on this topic, so go check that out. Oh, and to go back to an earlier word, inurement, the inurement thresholds are much lower with disqualified persons. All right, shifting gears away from people, let's look at restricted funds. Now, this is a topic we've covered a lot, so follow the links to the specific videos that deal with this topic in depth. But in summary, here's what it means. Restricted funds describe a donation that has been restricted to a specific purpose by the donor. Now, this can be the result of a direct solicitation by the charity to give to a specific cause, but it could just as well be an unsolicited designation by the donor 
that the charity chooses to honor. In either case, restricted means restricted. It must be segregated from the general fund and its use restricted to the intended purpose. Only the donor can release a restriction after the money has been set aside. Our next weird word is endowment. An endowment is similar to restricted funds in that the use of those funds is limited. An endowment is different, however, in that the funds are meant to generate income, not be used for operating expenses. It's the endowment earnings from investments that are earmarked for operations or other specific purposes. Now, you often see endowments with colleges. Funds may have been donated by one or more wealthy alumni, with the earnings being meant to be used for scholarships. Endowments are usually permanent, but they don't have to be. Some will sunset while others are perpetual. Here's another term usually reserved for private foundations. Program-Related Investments, or PRIs. A PRI is when a foundation makes an investment in a private commercial business that has a business model that is closely related to the foundation's charitable mission. Now, at first glance, many people's reaction to this idea is, wait, what? Private foundation can do that? Actually, yes, they can. But there's several caveats to that. A PRI must advance the primary exempt purpose of the organization, have no real concern about the investment producing a financial return, it can't be used directly or indirectly for lobbying for political purposes, and finally, it cannot jeopardize the foundation's mission. An example of this might be a foundation making an investment in a for-profit utility company that makes power grids in developing countries. Potential examples are endless, but one more thing needs to be said about program-related investments. They are complex and heavily scrutinized by the IRS. They are not for the novice foundation manager. Our final weird word or phrase is social welfare. We've talked a lot about this subject primarily when discussing 501c4 nonprofits. See our video on what is a 501c4 to check that out. 501c4s have as their primary purpose the social welfare of a community. However, that term can mean a lot of different things. In general, social welfare describes an activity that benefits the public in a nonprofit, non commercial manner, yet that public benefit isn't charitable in nature. Now here's some examples. Homeowners associations, advocacy or cause groups, some political groups, maybe a free community newspaper. There are so many possibilities to this, but I think you can see where this is going. Social welfare means there is a beneficiary group, but that benefit isn't a commercial activity, nor is it considered charity. As you can imagine, this list of seven could have easily been 77. There's so many words, terms, and phrases in nonprofit land that seem like plain English on the surface, but actually have very specific meanings that have zero relevance outside the world of nonprofits. Got some other nonprofit terms that you find weird? Let us know in the comments section below. Well, that's it for now. Go serve your community. Hey, do me a favor and don't navigate away just yet. We would really appreciate it if you would hit the like button below as it really helps get our content recommended to more people. Subscribe if you haven't already as we have great content coming your way on a regular basis. Finally, you can click the little bell icon to be notified of new content when we post it. To learn more about Foundation Group, you can visit us on the web at www.501c3.org. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.